Um, I was very sick a few years back and um, that's what had me return home. Oh, oh so yeah. you, are, you are Australian, you're not yes. you're not a Kiwi, <laughs> except yeah. with the highest sense of love. Is Kiwi a bad <laughs> word to say about people from the Oh, no. I mean, oh, okay. Ki Kiwis <laughs> and Aussies jokingly oh, okay. <laughs> not knocking each other. <laughs> Uh, do you know what? I think we're live now, and I really want to say thank you so much, Pat. We're here, and this is the first time we're meeting face to face. Well, sort of yes. meeting, yeah, uh, <laughs> since connecting first time in two thousand and six. Yes, um, wonderful. It's it's amazing, and so much has happened since then. And I was just I was mm. reading your website as well, yeah. And I there was this uh, quote saying you're um, Australasia's. Uh, answer to Patch Adams. Yes. <laughs> so what's that all yes. about? <laughs> I gave a, a presentation to, there's a medical group here called the Australasian Integrated Medical Association. And I gave a presentation to them. And at the end, one of the doctors in the room, he said that, <laughs> right, <laughs> as, as, as he thanked me. And I thought, oh, I'm going to grab that. <laughs> Yeah, um, definitely. So yeah, to um, what a brilliant quote. But yes. you, how many years did you did you work in in uh, New Zealand? Because now you're back in Australia, aren't you in Brisbane? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I was over there twenty years. Wow. Mm. Yeah, I went over there late nineteen ninety eight, I think, and returned a couple of years ago. Yeah. Well, yeah. you still have the Australian accent. Yes. <laughs> it's not that different, is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think if, if I went over there, like when I first came back, I had a bit of a bit of a twang. Um but yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, anyway, it's gone now. <laughs> and know, they, it's, they, um, sorry, go on. I was gonna say they have a, a practice, many Kiwis at the end of a sentence say A. So, like, if they might say, um, that presentation was amazing, eh? Right? Like, <laughs> a at the end, E-H. That is so funny. <laughs> I think that is so funny because I do that a lot. I thought it was just something people who speak English do. <laughs> okay. Oh, maybe. Uh, but it's a big habit over there. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. That is funny, though. But, you know, it's uh, your work has, has just been so amazing because like I say we connected a long time ago and I've been following yeah. what you're doing and and um, I don't know how many people know about your work outside of Australia and New Zealand and, and so on but so so you also run a radio station don't you or do you still do that? Uh, I haven't got that radio station but I am planning um, and, and setting up ready for another one. Um, yeah, I had a radio station over there for five years. Um, I did, at the very outset, I did two pilots in aged care. The first one, teaching the residents and the staff a half hour laughter yoga workout. And that was three months. Um, they became accredited as um, the world's first accredited laughter facility. That was through me. <laughs> Um, wow, and um, we got a world record in the Guinness Book of Records for laughing continuously for one hour. Uh, but we did it in rounders because I didn't want anyone to, <laughs> you know, <laughs> pass away <laughs> uh, while we were doing it. Too stressful. Oh, wow. um, then I did another pilot, which was for 12 months, assessing the residents and staff for their multiple intelligence. Uh, and then created an activities program delivering into those intelligences. So we had about 50 people a month coming and delivering a whole range of programs across the intelligences. And um, what, what does that mean? I've, I've never heard that term, multiple. Um, Professor Howard Gardner, probably 30 years ago now, maybe a little bit more, um, espoused that we don't just have IQ. In yeah. fact, we have many intelligences. Oh, right. We have yeah. practical okay. intelligence, kinesthetic, yeah. um, interpersonal, yeah. intrapersonal, emotional. Uh, we've got conversational now. We've got spiritual. But 
as a society, and I'm sure it's pretty much the same over there, we honour sport and we honour academia, but we don't honour any of those other intelligences in anywhere near the same way. And I so want to foster that because that if is people... so bring... exciting. I'm, I'm totally yes. with you on that because that is the way forward and that is where I think I believe the world is going with, with everything that's changing right now because we're at a total upheaval with everything that's going on. And on the other side, who knows what's going to be there. But I do believe, you know, with the lessons, a lot of people I think have learned over these many months that have been so different from life beforehand. Uh, I think so many people are waking up to a new reality where, like you say, academia and sport, it's not the only thing that people will focus on. And I hear yes. a lot in, in, you know, when I speak with corporate clients and, and so on, what they want from a session is, you know, it's, it's all the other values that are so important because that's how they encourage and they inspire and they motivate their staff. And you must see this in your corporate sessions as well. Um, yeah, I did. When I first moved back here to Australia, I my first contract, amazingly, was with a very big company and um, over, delivered over a 15 month period, this mental health in the workplace program um, to 450 business leaders. And it just heartened me beyond belief um, to see these men in high positions ready in a way I've never seen them ready all these last 20 years. Um, you know, when I started in New Zealand, I delivered into the health sector because I used to be a nurse. So I really knew that sector well, but I saw, well, you know, I'm not going to be self-sustaining um, because the health sector doesn't, you know, have a big budget. So I need to get into a business. So I um, started delivering into both. And, um, you know, the begin in the beginning, I'd be ringing businesses and, you know, I'm the world's first joyologist. <laughs> <laughs> and the person on reception would think it was wonderful. And she, always they'd say, oh, oh, we need some of that here. Oh. Um, but it was a hard conversation to enroll businesses into it. Um, 2006, I saw a bit of a shift. I worked with a law firm that had a five-year program they were initiating called Client Intimacy. And I'd just given a talk called Engaging Within Intimacy. Uh, and they heard me speak. <clears throat> so they kind of heralded the first awakening that um, yeah. in my world anyway. Um, and it was like, right, if this, one of the best law firms in Australia is open to having their staff to devote their time to having their staff engage with each other deeply. Um, this is just wonderful. Uh, the lawyers were a bit resistant. Um, and, you know, the once they came to appreciate, I'm still going to look great in my, you know, my wonderful suit. Uh, and I have my papers under my arm and, I, you know, still maintain that professionalism. Um, but being able to engage yeah. and engage deeply to have conversations. One of the um, things the manager of that project said to me, he said, Pat, he said, um, they were invited at, at the end of that time into Abu Dhabi. And he said that Abu Dhabians just invited us and put everything in place so that we could arrive with ease and grace. And he said, Pat, I just get it was about who we were being. That is Not how... so beautiful. Yeah. Oh. And you know what? I'm, I, I'm just sat here thinking that um, listening to your words and, and so on to what you're saying, that actually having a law firm totally buy into to the concept and the idea and, and the change it represents is fantastic because they are often really, really tough to break through to because of that professionalism. They don't want to let go of it and they don't want to be seen yeah. any other way than professional. Yeah. Where in fact, this really makes them maybe even more approachable than you initially think a low firm is. 
Um, yeah. And look, I think one of the barriers, the, the clown in New Zealand is very poorly received. Uh, people are very afraid of the clown. Um, and there's probably been a few spooky movies that have helped <laughs> helped with that. <laughs> spooky clowns. Um, and, and the whole idea that um, to be humorous is to be the fool. And no one wants to be the fool. Um, and th these 450 leaders that I presented to, the first session that I gave was every time to about 20 people, predominantly men. And in this first group, there was a man who was typical class clown, right? Yeah. He had uh, the puns and the metaphor. Um, and, you know, he even though it was a pretty serious subject, he was periodically and his peers would caution him. And I, and I stopped the session and I said, I want to intervene here. I said, I want to see today in your minds that this man is very valuable. His capacity to find the humour and the good, because there's nothing uh, bad about his humour. Right? It's very funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> you need to harness that rather than squash it. And, you know, I hope... It's really interesting because often, you know, when we go into workshops and, and uh, when there is someone who cracks jokes and, and so on, it's one of the things we don't really want because it's not what our master sessions are about. But I really appreciate what you're saying. It's, it's quite groundbreaking in a way because normally we would just ignore it instead of, of acknowledge it as something really valuable. Yeah. And I totally take that away from, from what you're saying. Um, because the other side of it, of course, with humour is that it's often targeted at something, whether it's yourself or, or something else in, in society yep. or, or other people. And that's where it's not necessarily connecting everybody like we do with the Lapa Lee, Lee facility. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so Joyology, where, where is that your brand? Did you? Yes. <laughs> I had... I had a whole series of losses at the turn of the century. I lost my home and my business here in Australia. My partner was from New Zealand. Um, my family weren't talking, hadn't talked since 1989. Um, so, and we didn't have, really have a place, soft place to land here. And he wanted to go home to New Zealand. He was from over there. And so we relocated. Um, owing $80,000, which we repaid in two years. The first 18 months that I was there, I had 10 car accidents. And honestly, they weren't my fault. <laughs> Nine times, someone ran up the back of me. And another time, someone collected me in the roundabout. I think I had some crash karma going on then. Um, I had cancer. And I had lost my first child. And then my partner of 20 years left with another woman when all of that was over. Um, he left. And it's, uh, I'd like to share, his parting words were, no, I don't love you. And I never loved you. Wow, that's harsh. And that's very harsh. Very harsh. Very harsh. So I never dreamed that we would you know, I thought we'd grow old and crotchety in a rest home. Um, so I never dreamed that that would occur. Um, so I didn't fare very well. I disintegrated. However, you know I made... I think that you're here now is quite extraordinary because that's some tough things that happen. Uh, and it sounds like it happened pretty much all at once or, or what? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> in a, a very short, very closed window. Um, my doctor wanted to medicate me and I kept saying to her, no, I have every reason to be unhappy. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, you know, my story, I have every reason to be, help me with my grief. And she wasn't the answer. And I ended up going to a grieving seminar at Starship Hospital, uh, being run by a man who, a doctor who'd worked with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Um, and he was there to um, support, there were 400 parents in the room who had lost or were losing their children. 
So it was pretty heavy energy. And um, he was there to help them create support groups once they left the embrace of the hospital. <clears throat> um, so that was pr pretty profound. Uh, about two hours later, I had a conversation with a man by the name of Peter Salerno uh, from South Australia, who's who was laughter leader for Australia for a couple of years, I think. Oh. Um, anyway, he'd written to me inviting me to bring laughter workshops to New Zealand. And I'm like, oh my God, okay, so I've got to ring him. So get the number and I give him a ring straight away. And he was telling me all about laughter yoga and we're killing ourselves laughing. And there was just this little lull in the conversation <clears throat> that very, you know, absolutely polite kind of a pause. No one's struggling to say anything. And that's when the message came. It was like, oh my God, we've got radiology, pathology, hematology, but no joyology. I'm going to be a joyologist. Oh, wow. Fantastic. And a joyologist so, you are. And, you know, I tell people, thank you. <laughs> I tell people now, I didn't learn about joy by studying joy. No. I, I learned about joy through my experience of shame, grief and embarrassment. And when I, when I did those two pilots, like my partner had left, family weren't speaking, everything that I'd known and was like an embrace around me had gone. Um, in a new country <clears throat> and I went to that rest home and I would walk in and those 29 elderly people loved me when I thought no one else did oh, and you know um, I have a, a huge attachment still to that because um, we don't honour and revere our elders um, and that's demonstrated with the number of deaths that have occurred around the world at the moment. So many people in aged care um, have passed and I believe um, obviously they're elderly and they may well have been their time. However, um, I ran an aged care facility years ago for six years um, and I know what can be done. And I don't believe we've um, afforded the care uh, that would have kept them safer. You know, I, I completely agree with you on that. And, and you know, the excuses are often things like, oh, we don't have time, we don't have the resources and so on. But we have a lot inside that we can, that we can give out and, and be there and so on. And yeah, of course, you need to have your time valued and so on. But when it's about human lives, I think that differently we need to step into to yeah. that way of being yeah? and not mm -hmm. necessarily think always about, oh, what's in it for me and so on. Well, what's in it for you is that you save lives and, and you're there for someone, even if it's their final moment. Um, I told you, I haven't worked in a care facility like you have been running one, um, but, you know, it's I work with elderly and, and so many of the people who I've met through laughter, worked with elderly and, and so on. And it's so rewarding because you are in there. And like you say, they love you. But it's not really what it's about. It's about that they actually find that spark of that joy. And yes, they yes. may place that joy on you, <laughs> but it is actually on yourself. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll, send you a, I'll send you a summary of that, um, that pilot. Um, <clears throat> the... Um, what happened for those residents, 29 of them, was they started to make a joke of their own infirmity <laughs> and the situations that they lived in. So they would pinch someone else's laundry from the laundry and put it in their, you know, little walking trolley and they'd get the undies out at lunch and hold it up at the table and say, whose are these? And um, they'd be on their walkers in the corridor and they'd be doing some of the laughter chants or, you know, um, and the, and they, they started to joke 
um, and you know they just uh, over the 15 months four people came off long-term antidepressants for oh, elderly elderly people and you know f for I wish if I'd realized because I had no idea what was going to happen if I'd realized I would have monitored and recorded in more detail so anything I have is just anecdotal but in essence they took back their power often oh, people in rest homes are passive recipients of whatever you want to do uh, and they took back their power and uh, part of that was I dared to show up in ways that no one else would dream um, when I was coming in every day I have a lot of hats that I've I wear so I'd have a different hat on every day and um, I don't have it now but I had a little kite that was about this big so um, if I was there you know I'd do the session and might stay for lunch um, and while they were kind of preparing for lunch I'd be running around the dining room with this little <laughs> kite right laughing and um, playing noughts and crosses on the serviettes um, and of course they just loved it. You know, you could just hear them. They're going, oh, and, you know, she was here again today and she's so naughty, writing on the serviettes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you and, had a different understanding as well for some of the things that go on in terms of, you know, what people need, because you also have the background as a grief counsellor, don't you? And even though yes, people are yeah. not necessarily passed away yet, I think sometimes there's a lot of grief from actually ending up in a care facility as well. That Absolutely. You don't grieve the fact that actually I'm here and all I want to do is be with my family and they yes. put me here or, or something like that. You know, it's all different situations, but yeah. you have this capacity to just uh, connect with people on so many different levels with all the background. You have like a nurse, you're a joyologist. Yeah. And then also understanding about grief that people go through. So you can really get through to people on so many levels. Yeah. One day there, I there was one lady very, very crippled with arthritis. Her hands were all twisted back on themselves. And um, she never complained. She'd get up at about 6 a.m., be showered. And sometimes they'd put her back to bed, sometimes beside the bed. Um, she was 90, 94. And uh, her nickname was Goldie, and she was good, right? She just never, never complained. Although I have some arthritic changes now, so I can imagine how much, you know, that much distortion creates a lot of pain. Um, and I always threatened her, and it was a joke for a while. I'm going to come and get into bed with you one day, <laughs> and I knew the owner was going to be away this particular day and I thought yeah I'm going to do it so I arrived in my little miss naughty pajamas a wool wig freckles slippers dressing gown and a little teddy bear <laughs> rock in and said move over and I'm here to grant your every wish today well she thought it was hilarious um, and I began by saying so what do you want for breakfast I said, do you fancy bacon and eggs? And she said, oh, we never have that here. I said, well, we do today because I'd already rearranged a lot of things. Um, so I pressed the bell and the nurse comes and I ordered bacon and eggs for two, which I'd already organised. So that arrives and we enjoy that and I ring the bell again and they take the tray away. And then, and of course, the staff have no idea why I'm in bed with Goldie. And indeed, even if I've got permission... <laughs> <laughs> um and then you know i said now if my memory's right you like mochaccino oh we don't have that here i said we do today and so the day went on till about 11 o'clock and by then the staff had had enough and the next person the next nurse came to the door and she's like quite angry and she said it's all right for you pat she said but we've actually got a job to do here and I got out of bed and I put my little dressy gown on and I grabbed my little teddy 
put my feet in my slippers and I went out in the corridor and I lay down and I chucked a tantrum like any wonderful two-year-old can <laughs> until they agreed to comply with my every wish. <laughs> Do you know I what? went it's and just one day, you know, it's not like the rest of their lives. <laughs> yeah. I went and joined them at the three o'clock um, turnover of shift. And I said, you're probably wondering why I'm in bed with Goldie. And indeed, even if I had permission, I said, you know, I've observed that Goldie probably has a lot of pain, but she never complains. She's 100% compass mentis. Here's what Goldie told me today while we sat in bed together. And I just recounted all these stories. Oh, wow. um, and the staff were saying, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And no, then Goldie's no. daughter arrived and knocked on the staff room door, poked her head around and she said, oh, she said, mum's been saying to me that she's had a clown in bed all day with her. And I thought she, <laughs> I thought she was losing it. <laughs> Oh, yeah. That lady, that daughter, called me after that day, Patch Adamstead. And it was probably 18 months later that I toured with Patch. She made me all these cards with Patch Adamstead. Oh. <laughs> that is amazing. But do you know what? Your story really made me think about, you know, is the kind of things that Patch Adams does as well. Um, but you're not Patch in any way. You're you're Patch. You just share the first three letters of his name, <laughs> or he shares the three letters. And look, I think I have a natural capacity yeah. to bring forth my impish self. I'm not a comedian, um, but I certainly am good humoured, and um, I know about commitment. The very first man I ever bed bathed when I started nursing was a man by the name of Bob Hall. And a crane had fallen on Bob. He had 35 broken bones. First of all, they said, he's not going to make it. Then they said, oh, we'll send him to theatre, but he'll probably die on the table. But he didn't. Mm -hmm. Then in recovery, they said, well, poor beggar, he's probably going to be a vegetable. So Bob woke up and revealed he wasn't a vegetable. And then they said, well, he'll never walk again. So he was in hospital the whole three years of my general nurse training. And I saw Bob Hall every day I was on duty, whether I was rostered on his floor or not. Bob walked on two sticks to my graduation ceremony oh, wow. and had something to say at the end. Now, I wasn't conscious back then, but I am now. <laughs> and I realize, look, even in my unconsciousness as a 17 year old, I made a commitment somewhere in my self that I'm going to show up for that man and I'm going to take him through his pain. Do you know Just that, when... that is so amazing. You know, you, your story is, yeah, I'm nearly sitting here crying with every story you tell because it's so moving. It's really touching. Yeah? And uh, all of the things you've told so far. And, and you know, the thing is, I what comes to mind to me is that too often people are told what they can't do when you have an accident, yeah. when you're in this, whatever you're in the middle of, and, and so, oh, you can't do that, and, and so, where it's other people who put a stop to what people can, and there are too few champions who actually say, all right, you know, it may never happen, but unless we try it, it's, it's definitely not going to happen, but instead of saying, no, it's definitely not, you know, we're given a chance, we're given yeah. a chance, and that's really what you know, it's a mindset you get into when you do yeah. this kind of work. And I don't think it's just through this kind of work. It's something we're, we're maybe born with. And it's just like you say, you were 17, so you weren't awakened or, or conscious yet. Yeah. But it was still there. You know, it was still there. Yes. And, that's and I did it even though I got into trouble. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in matron's office, you know, for the mis <laughs> mischief I got up to. And um, one time I remember she, um, you know, said anything, any more incidents like this. And um, 
I don't think she said, I'm going to have to let you go. She's, but she intimated, yeah. right? And I, I looked her straight in the eye and I promised I'm never going to get caught again. <laughs> <laughs> and she laughed. Very good, Ram. <laughs> and but see, you know, that's like what humour humor does that for you. Humour helps you be sharp, yeah. you know, because you can't worry and laugh. No. You can't do the two together. It's impossible. Yeah. So <clears throat> if you can, um, uh, you know, I'm not like this all the time. I have my moments, you know, but I am what I call fully self-expressed. I understand my emotional barometer and most of the time I can lift myself out of it at will. There'll be times when it takes longer than I others. I love that you say you're fully self-expressed because that is one of the key things. I always talk about or often talk about how people are so under self-expressed because, you know, we, we're told so many stories while we're growing up and we take them on as if they're the truth and we make the decisions that are not going to be expressed and so on. And years ago, this was back in, uh, what, 1997 or so, I went to a course where it was about, do you know what, it's getting back to your own self-expression and, uh, and I never looked back. You know, it, it really changed so much for me. Some of the yeah. philosophies wasn't for me, but you know, I learned so much from it because it reconnected me with with who I really was, um, and it reminded me as well of the times when I've just been that person who agreed uh, with other people. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I I, <laughs> I remember one of the comments when you know when in a relationship breakup was that um, who was I? You know, it, I didn't have any opinion. And I said, my comment back was, I do have an opinion. I have the same opinion as you. And then, you know, I, when I said it, I thought, wait a minute, that didn't come out right. But it was really, you know, you kind of, when you are a person who wants to be nice and please people, it's never going to bring you uh, yep. the joy from joyology and, and so on. It's, it's just going to be that mid wave where it's like, and going on yeah and yeah. uh and getting back in touch with self-expression was like amazing it wasn't because yeah. i was like just really quiet because it's a bit drama and all sorts of things but it was kind of different because when you connect with your true self-expression it's your own self that comes out to play and it's yes. your authentic self that really reveals yeah. yourself and i love it <laughs> yeah. but it's, uh, i was going to ask you a I'm, question and i keep rabbiting on <laughs> I, when, when all of that turmoil happened, I came across an improv acting troupe in Auckland and I, uh, they were called the Improv Bandits and oh, I went goodness. to their show <laughs> um, once a week at least for four years, sometimes twice a week. Um, and they on many levels saved my life because it's yeah. not scripted. No. All they're doing is being in the moment. They're working with who's present in the room. The, the four rules of improv, as I learned it are, first thought is correct. All players are equal. Nobody wins if someone tries to win. You need to be ready to give and open to receive. So that's what, you know, whose line is it anyway? That's how it works. They are present to each other in a way that most people have no idea. And, be, and an improv performer will never let another person fail. That is it's fantastic just, what you're saying. I've seen some, um, I, you know, improv is one of the things that's been on my radar for a long time and I've never done any improv training myself. It's one of the things I really want to do. And then Highly course, recommend, highly uh, recommend. But I've watched the, them. Yeah, thank you. I've watched. Yes. I went to a conference last year where I was um, I was running a laughter session with the, the the part of the group there, and then beforehand I actually because there were different events going on on this huge big mansion site there, yeah? and um, and I went into this 
place where there was a group, a, a an improv group, and I was, you know, I was probably I wasn't even part of the company. I was just there to facilitate the laughter session, but I was probably the one who laughed the loudest, and I felt really almost like I need to go because I don't want to draw attention to me. It's about the people in the room. It's not about me, but it was so funny. And the way they worked together with the, the audience in, in that yes. company, it was just amazing. It was, and they really, <laughs> I mean, loved it, loved it. And I thought, wow. And they're going to be at the conference I'm having in 2022 to do a little bit of, uh, of work with <laughs> the group. <laughs> but yeah. it's amazing. It's lovely to hear you talk about it. Because, you know, as uh, on the tour with Patch, the first day we came down to meet him in the foyer, he met everyone as they got out of the lift and some had been on a tour with him before, so he knew them. Uh, but he's really tall, as you know, he's about six yeah. foot eight. And um, the um, so we'd step out and he put his arms out and he said, I love you and gave us all a hug. <laughs> Yeah. So everywhere we went for 16 days, 36 people in clown persona. If we crossed a street, we would do it all single file and we're all going, I love you. I love you in Russia, right? <laughs> Hilarious. Because um, they're so somber. Um, and when I returned, uh, and I use this all the time if I'm doing a session, I'll invite the audience to turn to the person next to you and just thank them for being your companion today. So they do that. Yeah. And the energy in the room lifts. Yeah. So I call their attention to it. Did you notice that before we did that exercise, the energy was about here. And as soon as you did that, it lifted. So then I asked- hadn't even spoken with people next to them. You know, often people just come and they sit down in a chair and talk. And you know what? Gratitude is a magical thing, isn't it? It really is a magical thing when you yeah. say thank you uh, yep. to someone. Uh, so. <laughs> so speaking of conferences, you're speaking at a conference really soon, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. The uh, Merv Neal's Laughter... Uh, laughter wellness conference. Uh, yeah. I, I think I've spoken at about 15 now. I presented in New Zealand for many years. Um, I also presented at a couple of moves, came across and um, did that. And then since I've been back, I've been presenting every year. So it's like oh, my fantastic. my sabbatical. My <laughs> uh, I'll share it with you later because it'll be recorded. But my presentation this time is called I started a joke <laughs> that had the whole world laughing. <laughs> so I love drawing in. If someone says something to me, I've got a song for it. I don't know where that came from, but um, so I do like a lot of Facebook posts. I'll have a song will come to my head and I go, oh, I'll share that. So it's <laughs> like the heavenly DJ sending a message, you know, um, and most people are not present to language. And I'm really, uh, I want all of my words now to be a balm. I never, I, I would never have said what my husband said to me way back then. Uh, no, I don't love you. I never loved you. But when that happened, uh, I just committed, I want my words. From this point forward, I want my words to always be a balm. I never want to find myself in a vengeful place where I would create that degree of wounding. I'm that not going is there. So, so nice. I, I mean, it, not just nice is such a poor word to use for that because I think it's absolutely beautiful and very profound that, you know, the voice to be a balm. Because, you yeah. know, it's, uh, and I've been there myself where I've lashed back because people have lashed out or, or so. And it's so easy to react instantly instead of just stepping back just one step to just take a brave breath and really rethink and reframe the situation and come from a place of, of uh, healing instead of come from a place of whether it's vengeance or yeah. anger or, or whatever it is. Um, it's so easy to, to come into a discussion, a conversation, an argument 
with regret or with uh, anger or yep. resentment yep. Or, or whatever it is. Yep. And it doesn't serve any purpose at all. And it's actually quite appropriate to talk about because tomorrow is, is International Day of Peace. So, you know, we're creating peace within by just stepping back and, and uh, allowing ourselves to just take a moment and then respond from a different place. So our words, I love what you're saying, you know, so your words are a balm. I love that, really. Yeah. The And the I think a word I'd like to enforce for your listeners is <clears throat> I, I learned about commitment way back with Bob Hall. I wasn't really conscious, so um, since the turn of the century and all of those things happening, um, and I got the vision for joyology, and it took three or four years to get, the, to get enough IP to have a brand. Um, and then I did that work with the law firm, and they cemented everything. It's like, I am so on purpose now. In that few years, 2000 to say 2005, 2006, there were a lot of naysayers, professional speaking colleagues uh, who were saying, oh, you'll never get any work like that. You can't wear that. I have this beautiful hat that I wear, kind of a signature thing. Um, it's a $550 hat, <laughs> which, I didn't have to, which I didn't have to pay for. <laughs> You're going to wear the life out of that hat for that price. <laughs> <laughs> That's another story for another day. Um, and, you know, we've, I had to uh, really get connected to what are my values? What are my boundaries? Um, how am I going to stay in this pace when there's a lot of people who would uh, like the tall poppy thing um, and, you know, the <clears throat> um, see me as a bit of a joke. Um, and there was, um, there's a wonderful lady who lives in New Zealand. Her name is Daring Donna, right? She convened. New Zealand's first Be The Change conference in the year 2000, which oh. I spoke at. And we met, I don't know, 2001, 2002 at a, a National Speakers Association event. And I actually had my face painted with a monarch butterfly mask on at an ordinary meeting. <laughs> and she, she came over. Uh, I knew her from that conference and she whispered to me, Pat, what on earth are you doing here? <laughs> really? Oh. Just for the, you know, everyone's there in the grey two-piece suit and the, you know, the white shirt and the tie. Um, so there are so many people now coming through who are tentative. And I so want them to pick up the stick and find the confidence, right? You know, listen to that calling. You, you, we so have to listen now. Universe is asking us to oh, step I, forward yeah. um, because we we need to create unity. At the moment, there's a lot of disunity as, you know, people with disparate ideas on what COVID is or isn't, right? It's um, through all of the conditioning that's happening, they've been led to... Um, sling at each other. <laughs> uh, I'll see a lot of it online, um, but it's happening in the workplace too. Um, and to help people to be able to have brave conversations and to tackle the elephant in the room, call it, yeah. call it. Uh, I so know how much courage that takes. You've got to hold so much certainty about who you are and what you're here for. And I'm experiencing now a real sense of urgency. It's like I've got a raft of things I need to do and we haven't got much time. None of us know how much time we have. Um, it's interesting you say that thing about urgency. It's something that's been on, you know, the word urgency has been on my mind for a long, long time because it's like, you know, people 
people don't necessarily have that sense of urgency. Um, they think about a thing and then it's like, no, I'll do it someday. Yeah. Instead of saying, okay, the reason the thought has come to me now is maybe because I need to do it now. Yeah. And, and know, the more we feeling that urgency. Yeah. Is, uh, the more yeah. we do that, the more we respond really quickly to messages, insights, um, things that come in. Universe loves it. Yeah, absolutely. There was a time in my life when I would have challenging things happen and it seemed to be a long time before support would arrive. Yeah. Uh, and then I did uh, Dr. John Martini's breakthrough experience, I think in 2004. Um, and I got it. All right. And I just now, challenge happens, but support is there. Yeah. straight away you know so, so i'll be challenged in some way and the phone will ring and it's an opportunity or something um it's, I think it's I'm about just... trusting as well isn't it it's about trusting that this is what's going to happen and often people yeah. are like oh but i get all these things thrown at me constantly and, and so on i can't see my way out of it and you know that's where it gets stuck because instead of saying all right believing and trusting that we're not going to be Facing anything we can't handle, that's my belief anyway. That is yep. from me, yeah. But but I really firmly believe we're not going to be faced with anything that we can't handle. It's just how we handle it and how we deal with that challenge yes. at the time, isn't it? Yeah. Um, There's a, a saying, um, and I think it's from God. <laughs> uh, uh, if he leads you to it, then he'll lead you through it. Wow. And Yes, so the, it's like, <clears throat> I was, those first few years after my partner left were, you know, it was a mishmash and pretty messy at times, <laughs> but I still kept going. And um, I just really got everything that came up. I decided whatever comes up in my life now, I'm going to go to it. So every challenge, um, I had some colleagues uh, interfere with a professional event that I staged and I'd arranged other professional speakers to do certain things. And one of my colleagues um, undid all of that without my knowing. Wow. Um, so on the night I couldn't do anything, but the very next morning I did. And look, those kinds of confrontational things actually make me feel quite ill. Yeah. However, we, we, we have to learn how do I couch this in such a way that I am simply being masterful. I'm not out together because karma's <laughs> karma <laughs> arrived, right? There's a, I don't know, was it the Dalai Lama who said, um, first do nothing. So if you're ever in a world quandary, if you think you're going to explode, uh, I have that thought sit there sometimes. So it's like, no, wait. Yeah. yeah. You don't need to what sort this. About, wasn't it, you know, take a breath and step back and, and so on and look at the situation and yeah. come back resourcefully and, and so on because you're empowering yourself and you're actually yeah. also empowering the other person in your response then instead of... Um, you know, in an argument, there's always someone who's going to be, when someone is going to be right, there's always someone who's going to be wrong. So yeah. it's never going to end nicely, is it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so I really get now, I see challenge and support side by side. And yeah. the same with paradox and synchronicity. Yeah. And um, we can't control everything. But um, the first job that I had when I was in New Zealand, the attend was a private training provider. The attendance rate was 35% and so were outcomes. Not good. Long story short, I was there for two years. Um, that was just pre-2000. Um, and um, all of these students were second chance learners. So they, they had a process for disciplining them. And I thought, well, that's not going to work. So I refused to do it. And instead, I sat down with the students. And as I got to know them, 
I wrote everybody a one page letter honoring, celebrating, congratulating who's not, who I saw them being and how I saw them performing. I was a team leader. <clears throat> over, two, over that two year period, I wrote 2000 one page letters. Wow. When I left, the attendance rate was 85% and so were outcomes. Wow. Catch people doing something right. Do you know what? The whole the thing group. is about treating people as people, isn't it? And as human beings instead of just a number. And, you know, it's so easy to just, I imagine, to, to organisations where they have these figures and 30% and so on, and they want to bring it up. But if they don't have someone like you, who really sees the humanity in people and the value in each and every person. I think that's so profound that we do that instead of seeing, you know, oh, it's just a number and, and a number going through and yeah, okay, if it's still 30%, at least it's not less. <laughs> but it's not what it's about, is it? It's about really valuing people because the minute you do that, you create. Yeah. Some, someone who actually may go and, and be really, really successful. Whereas if you just treat them as, oh, they're not going to show up anyway. Well, you create that story for them, don't you? Yes. The One of the uh, lecturers at this place where I was working, one of the things she said in our first staff meeting, um, I'd proposed some new things and she said, <clears throat> um, you can't teach these people anything. Oh, wow. Right. So there was her listening of the student body. And I thought, right, <laughs> things but are going to change around to, here. <laughs> it's back to your patience when you were 17, isn't it? You know, that thing that you're never going to walk. You know, that yeah. people are putting so much stops on other people through simply just one sentence. You know? it's, and I think it's really sad. In, in so many ways, but that's why there are people like you and me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And those people who who decide they're going to take on self aggression and sharing it and sharing what's so amazingly liberating uh, in just having a little bit more laughter or seeing the funny side in things and stuff like that. Or being yeah. a little bit lighthearted about that. Yep. And right now, just... it's, like you say, it's so needed, isn't it? Because life is serious right now. <laughs> yes. But there's yeah. a cry out for the universe to do something that's different. And, and you know, the I'm really aware, again, in this last six month period, um, anything that I'm experiencing, like I'm single, so I've lived alone, and being alone and locked up, <laughs> uh, it, it's not good. Uh, it's not good. Um, so it's like, right. How can I be a contribution even if I can't go anywhere? Yeah. So, you know, I, I have committed to do at least two calls a day. Uh, Random. Who am I going to ring? Um, and also to, uh, and again, I think it's from the Dalai Lama, um, but to be the source of that which you desire. Yeah. So even before COVID, um, since I've come back here to Australia, I've wanted introductions. I've wanted, you know, keynotes at conferences, uh, clients to work one-on-one -on -one or in groups with. Um, so I have made those links and connections for other people, right? So be the source of that which you are looking for and it will come back. That is really, come, that's yeah. a really nice thing to, to give to people, uh, you know, on this. And you really are, you are such a fantastic, you know, front runner and, and role model for so many people. And, and I'm so chuffed to finally speak to you, to be honest. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> finally. <laughs> and, and look, I do get, it's like, it's no accident that all of us meet. When, when my partner left, I woke up about three months later and I'd lost all the pigment out of my skin up to my elbows. They'd, hands and arms had gone white. Um, and I had a white butterfly shape on my chest. Wow. Now, in the movie, Patch Adams, when his girlfriend is shot, <clears throat> he takes a battered old briefcase and goes and looks out over where he's going to build Gesundheit, 
And this is a true story. A monarch landed on his briefcase. Yeah. Oh, you're then, giving me goosebumps right now. And came, and then flew up and landed on his chest. So when I got up that morning and I saw my arms and I go and look in the mirror and I'm like, oh, my God, I thought of Patch Adams. And two and a half, say two, two and a half years later, we toured. But there was that lady along the way whose mother I looked after, right? And she called me Patch Adamstead. We're being given signals. And these signals are coming quicker the more conscious we um, allow ourselves to be. So the more we can get present to our life, <coughs> then I the more we the, will see the gift. Yeah, and the signals, looking out for the signals and listening for it, because, you know, it's all different signals we get, isn't it? But the thing, the key thing is that presence. I really feel that is one of the key things, because when we're present, that's when we notice it. And, you know, there's so much going on in people's lives. I know that. and in your life and my life and so on probably as well but unless we're present we're we're not going to change a thing are we uh, no. we're just going to plod along in what we always did so i just have a question for you are you all right <laughs> um i am actually thank you for asking <clears throat> the um it was very challenging and i did see a psychologist yeah. So how about now over these six months, I was thinking about, you that, know, that's, the, that's when I saw, I, I needed help. First oh, time in my life I've ever sought, I've had a coach in the past, yeah. um, but I found myself really experiencing a very deep, I am so self-sustaining. I can read and write and paint and draw. Like there are many things I can do, but, this was different. This yeah. was isolation. Um, and, and it wasn't a chosen isolation, was it? It's not been a chosen no, isolation no. for anybody. Um, and I thought, oh, look, I need help, actually. So um, I accessed a few sessions, and she was brilliant. Uh, it was just what I needed. And because she was not of, I could have talked to a friend, but a friend would have been kind. Yeah, uh, that's you know, thing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't want that. I wanted to be able to go blah yeah. and, you know, do the, uh, just let it come and see what was there for me. It's like, what's here for me? Why am I so upset? What is it? What, there's something. So courageous you are, Pat, for, for all the things you're going through and for these, for actually seeking that help because many people would just think, Oh no, I can do it myself. And especially because of the people we are, people think, well, you have the resources within. We're actually, you know, sometimes. Well, we, we no, need... we're not. We're... we're not an unlimited resource. No, no. And, and, and because. We after ourselves, we won't yeah. be able to be there for others, you know. And yeah. Be and because we have such empathy. Yeah. Um, then uh, you may well have heard of what the Victoria, what Victoria is like here at the moment. Um, it's just, it's beyond belief. It's a police state. Um, there are some horrific events happening. And as some of them rolled out, I couldn't be with it. I just couldn't be with the injustice. And I thought, why well, am I upset about that? And I realized I have had a whole series of moments in my life when I've been the victim of injustice. I was beaten on a train once many years ago and by a bunch of skinheads, they were called, um, carriage full of people, probably 30 people on the carriage, all reading the paper. Nobody came no to my system. Oh. And I fell off the train three or four stations along and the station master got called an ambulance. Um, but so I just, what's happening in Victoria became personal, right? I'm not there. It's, it's not here in my surround. Um, so when we experience these things, 
there's something for us to do. Yeah. And it's like, right, how do I use what I know to be a contribution into that space? Um, <clears throat> same with our bushfires. I've been talking to a man whose property was burned in the whole, whole thing, just devastated. Uh, and I've been talking to him every day since the 15th of January. I ring him every day just to check in. How are you doing? I'm not there to coach him, counsel. He can ask questions if he wants to. But And when I first rang him, I said, I want to be a point of certainty in your life when everything must seem uncertain. And and here we are, where are we? September. <laughs> and he and I have a friendship. Um, he's, you know, many, many miles away. <clears throat> he's in another state. Um, and yet we have that connection. And it's so simple. Anyone can do it. You know, he talks, I listen, and healing happens. Yeah, That's it. So right, you know, and but this is what I mean as well, that for you to also have someone who listens to you. Yes. Uh, and it's, you know, I posted something the other day about often when when men and women are strong in themselves, you know, not like physically strong necessarily, but we are mentally strong and emotionally strong and all the other strong, then people sometimes forget to say, how are you? You know, not just from, you know, the usual, how are you today? Not that kind of, but really from a point of yeah. being ready to listen. And, yeah. you know, right now we would, everybody should and, and would have the time to properly listen to each other instead of just the quick, how are you, that you hear down in the supermarket. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But you know what? You are so amazing, like I say, and, uh, and it's so wonderful to hear your stories and, and you really move me. <laughs> And we're actually over 11 o'clock, so I really appreciate what time is it that you are now. Um, it's just over 8, 8 o'clock. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so it's time for you to have a really good evening. Is there any final words you want to leave people with? I think there are tons of things people can be really taking away from, from having this conversation with you. The, when I first began, one of the things that uh, I made a commitment about was... Um, I want to help people find joy when it seems there's none. And all of us have the capacity to do that. Uh, a walk in nature with a friend. It can be that simple. Um, uh, but, you know, having, having these little phrases has helped me with clarity. Right? They're, they're little phrases they're significant to me so people will have their own but call them in you know stick them around the place have them remind you um because we do need reminding until things become really um embedded <laughs> all right as yeah. part of like our daily practice even when it's embedded like you say we're still just human beings and we have yes. days where we really do need the reminders so so the reminders are just really great. Yeah, that was a really good tip. <laughs> yeah. I have I, hope every... <laughs> I have a book called, and listeners could have a copy if they'd like. It's called Anti Zac, <clears throat> so it's a play on Prozac, <laughs> um, <laughs> and I wrote it after the tour with Patch Adams. Um, and you know the four messages are A is for amuse. N is for enthuse, T is for trust, I is for intuition, Z is for zeal, A is for attitude, and C is for creativity. So they're the chapters in the book. I'll send you a copy. Um, oh, thank you. And yeah, so I will, you know, I'll, this video will be uh, be uploaded to YouTube and I'll share your links as well and, and so on so people can yeah. read more about you and get in touch and, and so on. And uh, yeah. yeah, post it around. <laughs> so I'm just really grateful. Thank you so much. Oh, Pat. thank you. <laughs> I'm delighted to talk <laughs> after all this time. Yeah. So I could speak with you forever, uh, but you know, <laughs> yeah. we'd better cut it off yes. now, and uh, and we'll talk again. I'm absolutely sure. So yeah, just thank have you. A really, thank you so much. And you too. Thank you so much.
Bless. Yeah. Bless. And you. Yeah. Talk 